If you talk about cognitive science in general, you can distinguish between two uh, different aims. One is the explanatory, and that's the one I want to focus on. I mean, this is what we do as scientists. Then the other one is more constructivist. We can have an engineering perspective on, on cognitive science. We can use the models to construct lots of things. But the question I want to focus on is a particular case of explanation in, in, in the cognitive sciences, and that is how we learn concepts. And we know that children learn new words, new ideas very quickly. Basically, they learn eight to ten new words per day. And I don't, I'm not saying that every, every word is corresponding to a concept. But anyway, we have this capacity of learning things extremely quickly. And if we look at the models in cognitive sciences, they have not been very good at explaining this quick learning. So this is what I want to focus on. So we can start with the beginning of cognitive science. At the beginning, everything was to be, uh, the brain was thought to be a computer, everything, thinking was thought to be symbol manipulation. So there was this idea that the brain is a Turing machine and the Turing machine runs on symbols and you compute with things. And also in philosophy, this was, this was handled in, uh, uh, by logic. You expressed every, no every piece of knowledge you had in, in axioms and, and you had the derivation rules and so on. And the basis for these derivations are the predicates of a language. So language is built up on individual constants and predicates. Uh, and people in this logical tradition never really talk about where do the predicates come from. And if you write a computer program, you have variables or a correspondence. And it's the programmer who feeds in the variables. So these, this method doesn't really answer the question of where do the concepts come from. They are taken for granted when you formulate things in, 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 in logic. And then, of course, you can build up new concepts with, with logical and syntactic operators, with quantifiers and connectives and, uh, and so on. But the basic elements, they are never explained where we get them from. So that's a drawback of the symbolic approach. Then, uh, uh, the, well, OK, I've already said this. This is the general problem. How can you explain where the predicates come from? Uh, so this is a typical case in in, in philosophy of science, Goodman's riddle of induction, you, you, you have evidence that all emeralds are green. So we, we looked at all kinds of precious stones and we find them, these emeralds to be green. But then Goodman introduces two new predicates, these bleen and grew. And except we have exactly the same evidence for all emeralds being grew as we have for all emeralds being green. Somehow we think that this, this uh, predicate, grew, is odd. It doesn't fit with our perception and so on. But Goodman argues that there is a perfect symmetry between them. You can, you can define green and blue in terms of grew and blean, and, and, and vice versa. There is no logical distinction between these two predicates. So how can we know that one is reasonable in induction and the other one should not be used in, in, in induction? From a logical point of view, these predicates are totally symmetrical. So that's one example of a problem that arises because you don't really analyze what gets into the predicates. OK, we have the symbolic models. Then in the 1970s, we got a new methodology, methodology in the cognitive sciences. That's what's called connectionism. So now you don't have predicates. You have a lot of neurons, and they are, um, they are connected in uh, parallel ways. And there is a lot of different kinds of programming and activity going on here. I don't want to talk about uh, the details of connectionism. But that a paradigm totally left the symbolic area. And the, the predicates showed up indirectly there. I mean, the, the concepts, the, the neural networks, they pick up patterns of, of different kinds. And these patterns were supposed to correspond to, to uh, concepts. But one problem is that it's very difficult to understand what is really represented in the network. It's a distributed representation. And it's difficult to read off what exactly the network has learned. And, and another drawback of this approach is that the learning is, in general, very slow. You have to train and train and train a network on thousands of examples before it can pick up a particular pattern or something that we call a concept. So that methodology doesn't really fit with how humans learn things quickly. So my proposal is something in between. And I put it in between here because the symbolic level is on a fairly abstract level. You're supposed to have a language or something you can express things in. And connection is, is on, down on the neuronal level. It's a very detailed uh, level. And I put in what I call the conceptual spaces in between. 
There I'm assuming that we organize information in some kind of geometrical, topological structures. I'm not talking about language, I'm not talking about neurons. I'm talking about some kind of geometrical structure for organizing information. So that's what I want to talk about, and I want to say something about how this approach can help us in explaining how we can learn concepts uh, very early. So the key idea is that these spaces, they consist of quality dimensions. The basic ones are connected to our perceptions, but there are also other. And I'll give you examples in uh, one second. And the representations are not ba based on manipulations of symbols, they are based on geometrical topological structures. So let me start explaining this to you. So, quality dimensions. They are organized into domains. We have ordinary space with three dimensions, height, width, and breadth. We have time that we normally think of as a one-dimensional thing. Uh, we have temperature, also one-dimensional. We have weight. Color is a three-dimensional space. I'll talk about that in a second. Shape is a complicated space. We don't really know as from psychology, we don't really know how we perceive shapes, but we do. We can talk about things being more or less similar and so on. What I want to say is that these domains are quite separate in our minds. So, uh, uh, I, we, the domains are integral. I mean, we, if we talk about the dimensions of space, ordinary mm -hmm. space, we can't talk about the height without presuming width and breadth. These dimensions go together, so to speak. And there are psych psychological tests for these, these dimensions being integral. While you can separate space from color and can separate space from time and so on in, in, in ordinary perception. So they are what I call different domains. And they come with a particular structure, topology or metric. And now I want to give you some very trivial examples. Think of our representation of time. It's a one-dimensional line. And we have a designated point that is now. We can think of that as the zero point. And then we have the future. Uh, in one direction and the past in another direction. So our conception of time is a one-dimensional real line. That's the topology of our time dimension. Different cultures may have variations on this, but this is a standard in, in Western cultures. Then compare that to the dimension of weight. Weight is also a real line. We have from zero and to, to infinity. But it's only half a real line. We don't talk about negative weights. So it has a different structure. And this is a very trivial example of there are the, these dimensions come with, with different topologies or metrics. So here is a more interesting example from a psychological point of view. This is color space. And psych, in psychophysics, people have established that human perception of color goes along three dimensions. And you can describe them as the dimension of you, going from red, blue, green, and yellow, and so on. And that's a circular dimension. What does it mean to say that the dimension is circular? Well, in psychophysics, you know that there are these uh, colors are complementary. I mean, if you look at the yellow spot and then the white wall, you have a violet after effect and so on. So you can talk about colors being opposite one another on, on, on the color space. So that's the reason for why we have this circular representation. Second dimension is the intensity from gray and then brighter and brighter colors. Uh, not brighter, but more and more intense. And then the third dimension is brightness, going from white to black. These three dimensions are not totally independent, because when you get close to the white corner, you can make fewer discriminations. Uh, so uh, the this distances will be smaller. And similarly, when you get to black, uh, you can make fewer discriminations between the different views of, of, uh, of color. So basically, this is one rendering of how humans perceive color space. And in, it's an empirical fact that it's, this is how, we, how our concept of space looks like. Other animals have two-dimensional colors. They may not be able to distinguish between red and green, blue and yellow. Some animals have four-dimensional uh, uh, perceptions. They can distinguish a mixture of blue and yellow from a green color. Humans, in, in general, can't. One per, I've been told that 1% of women have this extra ability of distinguishing. They have an, a fourth sensor, so to speak. Um, but basically, this is a, a way of describing the topology and metric of, of uh, the color space. So that's what I'm talking about. Uh, we can also go to science and look at them and take a simple case of Newtonian mechanics. We can de describe very precisely what's involved here. We have ordinary Euclidean space, three-dimensional. We have a one-dimensional time. I've already talked about. We have a one-dimensional mass. Again, that's only positive mass. We don't talk about negative masses. 
And we have forces, which is a three-dimensional Euclidean space as well. And that's it. Newtonian mechanics contains these eight dimensions. They have a particular Euclidean metric. And then you, then, if you describe a particle in Newtonian in mechanics, this is what you need to know. And then you can apply the, the Newton's second law. And that, actually, this equation contains all the, all the dimensions. It's, a, it's an equation that connects information between the, between the eight dimensions. Uh, OK. So now I've given you some examples of the t what I mean by topology and metric here. And in, in, in the sciences, this is a very common way of looking at things. We have underlying dimensions, and we formulate equations that connect these dimensions. You can make predictions via these uh, connections. Human categorization of things goes very much by similarity. You see something, you, you learn that some bird is a duck, and then you see a similar thing, you, and you call, will call it a duck. You will not call it a goose or anything like that. We learn uh, to, uh, to understand concepts by similarity. There is a lot of psychological evidence for this. If you go back to these uh, symbolic representations in terms of predicates, there is nothing related to the similarity in, in, in our symbolic definitions. There is no way of expressing similarity in, in logical uh, uh, notation. So that's a limitation of the symbolic approach. While, if you work with conceptual spaces, similarity simply means that you're closely located in a space. One, if you go back to the color space, um, I mean, two points that are closely located here are similar in color. That's the, that's the point of the space. I mean, the space represents similarity. So that's one advantage of, of uh, this approach, that space, uh, spatial representations gives you automatically a representation of, of, of similarity. I have made a distinction. In classical logic, you only talk about predicates. I divide predicates into two, two groups. One is what I call properties. The other is what I call concepts. And for me, a property is something that only represents one domain. So you have color words like red, green, and so on. They represent properties. You have temperature words like warm and cold. They, that's a property. You have size words like big and small, and so on. So most adjectives represent properties. There is a mapping in, in natural languages between this distinction. While concepts, for me, is something that connects a number of domains. So when I talk about the dog, I mean, the dog has lots of properties. It has a color, it has a size, it has a shape, it has a smell, it has a sound, it has a weight, it has a temperature. I mean, it has properties in lots of domains. And what constitutes the concept of a dog or a chair or a car is that there are some correlations between uh, these, uh, these uh, uh, spaces. So, let me give you an example of a property here. Red. I, I should also emphasize that a, a property, in my definition, is a region in a single domain. And I make this mathematical assumption that a property corresponds to a convex region. And convexity is a very simple mathematical uh, um, notion here. Convexity simple means that if you call this color red and if you call that color red, then any color in between will also be called red. I mean, convexity is about betweenness. And this idea of convexity is very important here because that helps you in understanding how you can learn things. If you have observed a few red things, I mean, if you're learning a new language or something like that, then you know that everything in between will also be called by the same word. That, and the things in between will be similar to the examples you have, you have learned. I will get back to this idea. But Convexity is something that is very important. I mean, the, this assumption that concepts, or properties and concepts are built on convex regions is very important for the learning, learning principles here. So, you can talk. I, I made, some years ago, I made a predic prediction that, I mean, different languages have different ways of carving up the color space. We have, f some languages have very few color words, some languages have lots of color words. But I made a prediction that in every language, each color word corresponds to a convex read. And that time, I didn't have very much data uh, evidence for it. But then there was a German linguist, Gerhard Jäger, who went through 110 languages for which you have this color data. And he found very strong support for this idea that in any language, a color word corresponds to a convex read. So that's, I was very happy about that, of course. So, and the concept is just, not just a convex read, but also some, some domains are more important than the others in, in understanding a concept. 
I mean, if you're looking at the dog, the, the shape of the dog is much more Im important than its smell in order to uh, understand whether something is dull or not. And then they are, they are, they are, the regions are correlated in different ways. So let me give you a toy example. Here is my analysis of an apple. So an apple has a, a, a color, a taste, and a shape, and it's a particular kind of fruit, um, and it has nutritional values. When you're a child, you learn about an apple via these three domains, the color, the taste, and the shape. That's how you learn what an apple is. Uh, and, and the colors are red, red, green, yellow. You don't find blue or black apples. Uh, the taste is sweet. Uh, I mean, taste has four or five dimensions. Psychologists are arguing about that. But when it comes to apple, it's mainly the sweetness and the sourness that are important. And the, the, it's, well, I can't really say how shape space is constituted. But what distinguishes an apple from a pear is that an apple has much a rounder shape than a pear that is, has a different shape. Otherwise, apples and pears are, are more or less similar. And, uh, and um, then, of course, when you grow up, you learn more about apples. You can start, start talking about other domains like n nutritional values and so on. You can start talking about the prices and smells and, and whatnot of apples. And if you get into the scientific era of pomology, you can start talking about what characterizes the, the biological aspects of, a, of an apple. What I'm saying here is that a concept is not a fixed set of domains, but you can learn more about the concept by adding more values, more domains to, to your knowledge. When you're a kid, you learn a few domains, the, the basic ones, but then you can expand it. So a concept is, is not fixed, it's a dynamic thing. You can learn more or less about it. Uh, and there are correlations. I mean, there is a correlation between the color and the, and the sweetness. I mean, the, a red apple is more likely to be sweet than a green apple. So that we have these correlations. Uh, 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 um, a big dog gives a different sound from a small dog. I mean, the, the voice uh, characteristics are different. And a big dog has a larger weight than a small dog, of course. So uh, there are lots of correlations. And that's part of our our understanding of concepts as well. And we're very good at picking up these, these subsets here. Now, let me get into the learning area of, of um, um, concepts here. Now, I've, I've given you the idea that concepts are represented in geometrical structures. So now I'm, I'm supposing that we have a two-dimensional space. This could be the space of fruits, it could be the space of birds, it could be the space of colors. So we have a domain. And we have learned a number of prototypes. This is typical green and typical blue and so on. Or we can take, this is a typical duck and a typical goose and a typical swan. You can have prototypes. I'm taking the idea of a prototype from, from psychology. We know that people organize, organize their concepts around prototypes. But if we locate these prototypes in a space, and now I'm making the extra mathematical assumption that we can talk about distances in the space. There are some conceptual spaces where we cannot talk about distances. But if I make the additional assumption that we can talk about metric spaces with a distance, then we can talk about some new observation being closer to one prototype than to another prototype. So I've learned that this is, this is a duck, and I've learned that this is a goose, and now I see this type of, of, uh, uh, of individual. It looks uh, more like a duck than it looks like a goose. Consequently, I will call it a, a, a duck. So having the prototypes and using the simple idea that even when you see a new item, when you see a new object, you categorize it with the closest prototype. Closest prototype means the shortest distance. Then you get mathematically what's called a Voronoi tessellation. And I mean that these lines are the dividing lines in distance between the points. And, uh, you get a partitioning of the, of the space. It doesn't have to be two-dimensional. This works for any, any dimension of, 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 of any number of dimensions. Um, and furthermore, there's a very nice property here. These Voronoi tessellations always end up in convex regions. I mean, that's a, uh, that's a, con that's a follows from, from, from this definition. Always sort new observations with the closest prototype, then automatically you have uh, a partitioning in, in, into spaces. So this, I hope you see this. Now I've given you a very simple learning recipe. We'll somehow, by a few examples, pick out a prototype. And we have these prototypes. We, we um, have the concepts, because the concepts are defined 
by the distances from the, from the prototypes. I'm using a geometrical notion here to generate how we, uh, concepts. Now let me s tell you something about how this helps us in learning things quickly. So, uh, let me tell you a very simple story. I'm a father, I go with my two, three-year-old daughter to the pond, and we see all these birds, we see the we see number of ducks and geese and, and swans. My daughter doesn't know anything about birds, but I start talking and pointing that this thing is a duck and that thing is a goose and that thing is a swan. No, I mean I'm pointing to places in the conceptual spaces, but they have different shapes, they have different uh, colors and, and, and so on. It's a multidimensional space, but she can perceive the similarities between, the, between these different individuals in, in, in the pond. And on the basis, if she's seen th three ducks, I mean these three, and I've called them ducks, and she's seen these and they call geese and so on, these are called swans, she can formulate a prototype. She can ba basically, the crosses here are simply, simply the average of, of, of the points. So this is a very I mean, naive mathematical idea, but I mean, I, I just want to do a simple model here. That on the basis of a few examples, you can formulate an average of what you've seen. And you can take that average to be the prototype. And once you have the prototype, then you can make these partitionings. You can, you can uh, uh, um, divide things into concepts. So if she sees a new bird that's here, she will call it a swan. I and mean, if she, is a bird, she sees a bird who is he that is here, she will call it the goose and, and, and so on. So, this explains that given only a few examples, we can form prototypes and we can form uh, categorizations. Uh, so we can explain uh, the quick learning. Uh, actually, you can form only one example, you can form an average. But of course, this model is dynamic as you learn more examples. The prototype, the averages may move around. The prototypes are not fixed. But at each point of time, you have some kind of average of what you've seen, and you use that as a basis for categorization. But I'm, as I'm saying, categorization is, is dynamic. It's not fixed. So, let's see now. We continue the story. I, we find a new bird in the pond. This, uh, it's this point. It has, it has some odd properties. It, the, the hash lines here are the old classification. And I insist, I mean, I know more about birds than my daughter does, so I insist that this is a, as a duck. It's a mandarin duck. It looks a little bit odd as a duck. But I insist it's a duck. So now she adds this, this example to her repertoire of ducks. And consequently, the, the average will move. So the prototype for a duck will move a little bit. And as a consequence, the borderline between ducks and geese will move. So the, the concept will, will be adjusted a little bit here. And there is f a fair amount of evidence from how children learn uh, concepts that this, this model is, well, it's not totally unrealistic. I mean, it, it, it explains a number of things. Uh, uh, I will give you one more example of that. Uh, so in, in contrast to analytic philosophy, ordinary logic, where predicates were supposed to have a fixed meaning, I'm giving you a, a story here where you can have, uh, you can have a, a dynamic meaning of, of concepts. I can also explain why concepts are sensitive to context. So, let's talk about the word hot and hot, hot bath water in contrast to hot water. So, here's the, here's the temperature scale. That's what's involved in hot here. And normally, hot means being in the upper half of, of, the, of, of, of an interval, of the temperature interval. So if you look at ordinary tap water, it's somewhere between 0 and 60 degrees, I mean, on, roughly. It's, uh, the borders here are not so. So hot, means, uh, hot tap water means being uh, more than 30 degrees. That would be no, the normal meaning. And, and I mean, there, there, there are vague borders, and that doesn't matter very much. But if you look at bath water, I mean, you wouldn't like to have bath water that's close to 0. I mean, bath water is somewhere between maybe 25 and, and 60. So hot bath water then means that it has to be at least 40 degrees to be hot bath water. So hot is dependent on the contrast class here and the context you're talking about. So hot doesn't have a fixed meaning. It's dependent on the underlying, underlying structure. So let's do one more example of, uh, no, I don't do it here. But let's, this, this is another example. And this is that I, I said that some domains are more or less prominent. Some are more important than others. So now I have another story to tell you here. Uh, let's say that P is fish, P 
is uh, P1 is fish, P3, the pr third prototype is mammal, and uh, this is bird. So you talk about the space of, of animals. But you can have two dimensions. You can have the, the um, biological, uh, I'm sorry, what should I say, the, the um, bodily characteristics of, of the in individuals, and you can have the ecological characteristics that fish swim in water, birds are in the air, mammals are on land, and so on. That's the ecological. And this is whether they give birth to live youngs or whether they lay eggs or, and uh, this is, uh, well, there are some other, whether they have lungs and, and, and warm blood and, and whatnot. I mean, these are the, so, I mean, I'm, I'm de only depicting two dimensions here, but you should think of them as a collection of, of knowledge about the biological uh, properties of an animal and the ecological properties. And I put the fish and the, and the, um, and the uh, mammals and the, and the birds here. Now, Q represents whales here. And if you focus on the, if, if the ecological conditions are more important, I mean, this scale is bigger than that one, simply put, then whales will be categorized with fish. And for many hundred, hundreds of years, whales were fish because they swam in water, they had the shape of a fish, and, and they had lots of ecological properties in common with fish. So in many languages, it's, uh, whales are actually called whale fishes. Uh, but then came the biologists, I don't know, 18th, 19th century, I don't know when they discovered that uh, uh, whales share a number of properties with mammals. They have lungs, they give birth to live children, uh, I'm sorry, no, no, they don't lay eggs and, 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 uh, and so on. They have a lot of properties in common with, with mammals. So what happened was that because of the biologists, the properties, the biological properties of the whales were more, became more prominent, was put more emphasis on, on, on their biological properties than on their ecological properties. And what happened then is that this dimension gets more important. I mean, it became, becomes longer in, in representation here. I still have the same relative distances between the prototypes. They have not moved. But just by adding more emphasis to one dimension here, the division will change because the average distance between a, 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 a fish and a mammal will now put the whales among the mammals. It's not, a order, it's not a typical mammal, but it still will f function within that. So I, it's, this is a toy example, but still it shows you that depending on the prominence of different dimensions, you, will, you can, may, may reclassify certain, certain individuals. And this story about the whales is a, a, a histor historical example. Of, uh, uh, of this. Okay, um, I'm, 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 I'm finished. Uh, <coughs> let me sum up. My original problem was to explain how we learn concepts. And I said that in the symbolic approach, there are, there are no, there are basically no explanations of how we learn the predicates. And the connectionist models that were the alternatives. You can talk about how a neural system can learn a thing, can learn new concepts, but the learning is very slow there, and I can give you an explanation of why it's slow. Then I introduced this idea of representing information in terms of geometrical structures, and I've given you a fairly simple mathematical model. I'm not saying this is the true model, but I've given you a, 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 a simple model based on prototypes, Voronoi tessellations, uh, and convexity. Um, not very deep mathematical notions. That provides the basis for an explanation of several features that we find in, in the psychology of, 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 uh, of concept acquisition. Uh, we can uh, say something about, explain a few things, we can explain many things about how children learn languages. We can explain things about how changes in science will change our, our concepts uh, and so on, on the basis of these uh, geometrical structures. So, what I've, I'm saying here is that, is that the fundamental framework, the fundamental format of our representations are important for what we can explain and what we cannot explain. I've focused on the topic of concept learning. Thank you very much. Thank you.
amount. And then the question is, do we project all those categorizations or do we discover <coughs> certain objective relations yes. that allow us to be correct or incorrect in yeah. our categorization? Yeah. Yeah. Ah, that's, of course, a very important question. I say they, I, you're right, I said that they were fish, now they are mammals. If you are a conceptual realist, like uh, the old Greeks, like Plato, or, or, or like Frege, and so on, you would say that they, they were always mammals, but we were miscategorizing them. Uh, I don't think so. I'm a conceptualist. I mean, if you go to back to the medieval, medieval tradition, I'm a conceptualist. We, it's our, our way of thinking about the animals that determine whether they are, are whales or not. I'm not assuming that there are, I, I'm not assuming that there are any natural categories, natural uh, kinds. So I'm, I'm, I'm against this idea of natural kinds, and that comes out quite clearly. But of course, if you, if you believe in natural kinds, you, you will have problems with my account here. So there is a clash between realism and conceptualism. Uh, but I, I think that if you take the conceptualist approach, you can s explain much more of how humans learn categories. Then, of course, philosophers may not be satisfied with that. They want to say something about how the world really is like. And for me, that's a totally different story. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about how humans learn, learn concepts. Yep, yep, yep. Yes, yes. Two very good questions. The first one concerns matrix, and I've, I've given you a very simple story here where I'm, I'm, I'm using Euclidean matrix only. Now, I also said that for some domains there are no, there are no, there is no metric. I mean, we can have, we can have classificatory systems. I mean, a genealogical tree or something. You can still talk about betweenness. You can, I mean, even if you have a graph, you can talk about betweenness. But there is no metric. Yeah? So the assumption of a metric is, is an additional assumption here. I have, there are some cases where you don't want to have Euclidean metric, you want to have the Minkowski or the city block metric. And I recently, together with the Dutch linguist, studied prepositions. And it turns out if you use a polar metric, you get a much, much better uh, account for how we, how we uh, classify the meaning of prepositions. Uh, so polar metrics comes in surprisingly. I mean, it was just a big surprise that this gave us a very neat classification of of, uh, of the meanings of prepositions. And your second question was on... Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, no, okay. That, of course, very good question. I've only talked about perceptual dimension, more or less perceptual dimension. And of course, we have these abstract, uh, abstract structures as well. Uh, and in many cases, we don't know the underlying space. We can't identify the underlying space, so we don't know whether concepts are convex or not. So that's, that's a kind of analytic task so to identify the, 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 uh, the structure of the domain. I mean, I talked about the color space. There has been a lot of work to get in psychophysics to get out this uh, general shape of the, of the color perception, and people are still fighting about the details here. But basically, they agree that it's a three-dimensional uh, space. So for many of the abstract domains, we don't know it. And uh, for me, that would be a research program to extend it to more abstract domains. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think my question is super similar. So uh, you said that uh, the Thank you. Another very deep question. 
this basically goes back to Goodman's criticism of similarity. I mean, I've talked about similarity as perceptual similarity. But when we judge similarity, it's not only per our perception, but we also talk about, we also think about these abstract domains. And you mentioned the word cause here, and that's very important, because we think of other, other domains that are hidden behind the, the perception. So in Kiel's example, I mean, this, this notion of living things, we have this, no, this idea of some things are living, some things are non-living. And we, we somehow have a causal theory uh, based on that. I haven't analyzed the, the uh, causal domains in, in details, but that would be an example of, of the more abstract domains. The point I want to make is that similarity, I mean, this is against Goodman, similarity is not just perceptual similarity. Similarity has to take into account the hidden, hidden domains, the more, more underlying, deeper, deeper domains that we find in science or that children are... I shouldn't say more or less born with, but I this distinction between living and non-living. Or take, uh, what's his name, Paul Bloom's example of the Cartesian baby that we very often, we very quickly learn that people have other minds, uh, and that comes very quickly, and that's part of our explanation of human behavior. So. It seems that to define something like complex set, you need some more structure, so some fine or media structure in this, uh, because mm -hmm. okay. otherwise you No, no, convexity is much more d d general than having only affine tra transformations. You can, on any graph, you can define b between it. I mean, uh, you have nodes and so on. So you don't, and you can talk about all kinds of transformations of graphs and preserve convexity. So convexity is much more general notion uh, than, than just having a linear, li linear space. That, 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 I mean, I, I said that I only worked with Euclidean examples here, but uh, there are other domains where you need other, other metrics. And if you look at the polar coordinates that I talked about for prepositions, but the convexity a totally different meaning, not totally, but a different meaning than convexity in, in, in Euclidean space. In any case, you need some additional structure to say what does it mean? Yes, yes, yes. I need, I need to specify the, 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 the structure of the space. But what I want to say is that between us, it's a fairly general notion that you can apply to a large number of, of mathematical structures, including graphs. Uh, no, I mean, I talked about prototype theory, and I only may mention this idea that you go by more or less similar. But another part of prototype theory is that there is a hierarchy of, of uh, basic level co concepts and subordinate, superordinate and subordinate concepts. And that would show up as, as a different degree of uh, granularity in these spaces, more or less. And you would need to do, use this partitioning to define some kind of tree structure of superordinate and subordinate. You can do it. It's not very uh, simple, but it can be done. And, and, uh, um, if, if concepts are overlapping, they are normally belong to, uh, to, to different domains. That, that would be my quick answer to your question here. Yeah. My question is about um, possible limitations of this theory. Uh, one problem I see is that dimensions, if you uh, differentiate between concepts and dimensions, uh, some dimensions you mentioned are also concepts, like nutrition, for example. Yeah. How yeah, yeah. It's a dimension of the concept. And another thing is uh, so called relational concepts, like being larger in yes. general. Yes. Uh, you, you maybe you cannot uh, find a particular aspect, uh, place in conceptual space that represents being larger in general. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I mean, I, I complained about the symbolic approach that it didn't explain where the predicates come from. I can complain about my own approach that I don't explain where the dimensions come from. And, and, and uh, I mean, to some extent, I've done it. I try to show that for the more basic perceptual levels, we can, we can use psychophysics and so on to, to extract the underlying structure. For more abstract domains, there, there are problems. I don't have a general program for doing it. Actually, I would use 
uh, I would look at metaphors to find out what are the structures, because metaphors between domains, they reveal quite a lot about how we think about the abstract domains. That would be one strategy, it's not the only one. Then you say that we need, when I talk about the concept of nutrition, we, we, we are talking about the domain. Yes, that's true. I mean, we, when we speculate about uh, or think about these domains, we need a name. And basically, we, we, we can't talk about n nutrition or, unless we have language. So, I mean, on the, high, on the meta level of talking about domains, we need some kind of uh, maybe symbolic expression. But now we are on, on a kind of meta level of representing information. I mean, that's uh, when we, as children, learn concepts, we, we do it directly on the domains. I, I, your, your question is, is, is very good, and I, I would. I would have to work more to answer it in, 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 in completely. We should stop. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.